So I was a young Jehovah's Witness in a beach town in Australia. And uh, I had had a very imaginative childhood with lots of drama classes, but I became a Jehovah's Witness as an adolescent. And suddenly all of those extracurriculars were not allowed anymore. And instead of going to university to explore theatre and music and, and all sorts of wonderful worlds, I was knocking on doors and uh, extracurricular things and books that weren't the Bible or the Watchtower magazine were discouraged. And I started watching theatre sports on television, which was on television in Australia at that time. And then there were some workshops that came to my hometown. And I went to those workshops and I started going to the closest big city, which was Brisbane, which was a quite a long drive and going to see the shows. And I became completely hooked into this wonderful world of imagination. I had to not tell the elders I was doing it so they didn't ban it. But I remember when I got the book, Keith Johnston's Impro, which was recommended to me by my Impro teacher. And that was the first time I'd heard, I think, of Keith Johnston when the teacher talked about it. And he was presented as the source or the creator of a lot of these impro games that I was playing in the principles. And I devoured the book and it allowed me to go to fanciful places in my mind when I was a very unstimulated girl, really, um, adolescent girl, knocking on doors and having no stimulating, creative, imaginative life having been a very imaginative child. And so I would read this book in secret. And I remember, uh, I think in the introduction, there was somebody who had, I don't even know who it is, who improvised a little poem based on what he'd learned from the book. And he said, it's not very good, but I've just made it up out of nothing. And so I started doing that because I didn't have much access to the workshops or the shows, they were only things I could do sometimes. And I couldn't really live that life fully. Or It was a bit of a double life. I went off with some other young Jehovah's Witnesses who shouldn't have been going, but it wasn't something I could actively live. Um, I mean, it wasn't quite The Handmaid's Tale, but that vibe, you know, <laughs> keep your head down. And I would read this book and I would make up these poems in my head out, and out loud in my room. And I would find ways of adapting the principles so I was sitting on a bus and I could point at things and say what they weren't in my head or I could imagine little improvisation scenes and so it was really an escape for me you know the scene in The Handmaid's Tale where where June uh, goes into the wardrobe and she sees that the previous handmaid has carved into the wood don't let the bastards grind you down in Latin and it's like a secret message and sometimes she goes and looks at it in a much less dramatic way, but in a way that I felt quite connected to, I would spend time with this book as an imaginative escape from a world which allowed no creativity or stimulation of this sort. And I remember, especially the last chapter, I used to try not to read it because the masks chapter, absolutely seen as demons. You put the mask on and something you don't understand inhabits your body, demons. So I used to not really read that very much because I was a bit scared of it. But every now and again, I'd read the demons chapter and I'd be like, mask, what would that be like? So I moved to London on a sort of gap year and I started to drift away from the Kingdom Hall. And I decided eventually I would not go to the Kingdom Hall where the Jehovah's Witnesses worship unless I really wanted to, I wouldn't go out of guilt and I never went again. And immediately, I just felt this sense of freedom. And I remember I was nannying in London. I looked in Time Out magazine and I saw, it said, London Theatre Sports. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. And I, I went down, I remember booking tickets because in Australia you had to book tickets or you wouldn't get into the show. And so I remember phoning and booking tickets and they were quite surprised. They were like, well, you can just come. Like, this, no, it's not going to be full. And I remember being so surprised because it was in a small fringe theatre and where I'd come from, it was in a really big theatre and it was packed and you had to book ahead or you would not get in. And there was a sort of hysteria around it of students and artists. And in London, it was much more, it wasn't theatre sports, it was called London Theatre Sports, but it was much more like games and scenes. And it was good fun. And I still really loved it. And I started going to the workshops and it was great, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. 
I knew I was looking for what was in the book. And what was in the book wasn't about can we be funny and clever and learn to play certain games. It was much more about accessing a voice within. And you have to remember, I was coming out of a high control group. And a high control group is all about questioning every single thought you have, every single thing you do. Am I doing this to honor Jehovah's name? Am I doing this out of vanity? Am I doing this for the wrong reasons? Should I be doing this? You're questioning and questioning and questioning and questioning. And what was in Keith's book was the opposite of that. It was the freedom of the spirit, the play of the mind, the yes, let's go down to this dark place or this sexual place or this exciting place or this forbidden place or this childish place. Say, yes, it's not real. Can't really get into any trouble here. So I had to untrain my mind and I knew that as great as this group was and as much fun as they were having, it was more like pub prof, like fun games. And it was learn the rules of the game And if you're talented, you'll be funny. And if you're untalented, you won't be funny. And I felt like a judgment sometimes coming off some of the teachers, like, oh, you're not as funny as he is. And I was like, I know that in this book is the secret to the idea that that talent is procedure. And and are you going to be in the moment? And are you going to let your brain do the work? And I couldn't get there. And I remember they said, Oh, next weekend, a teacher is coming from Canada. She's going to do a masterclass. Her name is Patty Styles, and she has been trained by Keith Johnston. And I spent two days just completely immersed in this process. And I was like, this, this is it. This is what's in the book. This is what can free me. This is what can unlock me. And I remember on the second evening, um, I followed Patty to the tube and got on the tube with her and I was saying okay so how long are you in London and she said about six months and I said so how much can you teach me in this time and what would I need and Patty said well you need four people in a room and I said can we pay you and you know it was it was it was uh, we were making logistical arrangements at the at some point on this very long tube journey, Patty was getting off and she said, where are you going? And I said, oh, my car's parked back at the workshop venue. I just got on the tube to talk to you, which I imagine she thought was a little odd. But I was so desperate to be in this company and not let her go. I was like, I don't know where she's going to go because it was well before like you just friended someone on Facebook and followed their activities. I was like, what if I never see her again? And so we arranged this, what we call the secret improv group, because it was only for a few people and... And we would go and we would work from 6.30 till 2 in the morning. Just hours, hours and hours and hours. So I'm probably best known for the Guilty Feminist podcast, which has had 65 million downloads in under three and a half years, which has been a phenomenal, a phenomenal experience. Um, And we platform uh, women mostly uh, and non-binary people and sometimes men talking about how we can close power gaps, but we do it through comedy. So there's, uh, we do one-liners at the top, we do stand-up comedy, we have discussions. Sometimes it gets, you know, more serious, but most of the time, most of the podcast will be comedy. But we are talking about how we can change the world and how we can take up more space within the world. And I can honestly say I would not have been able to do that without Keith Johnston's techniques, because Keith taught me how to open my mouth and start a sentence with confidence. I remember Keith saying, If you don't know what to do, have your character say, I know just what to do, and your brain will finish. Your brain will know what to do. Start the sentence confidently. And I remember reading that in the book. If you start a sentence with confidence, you trick your brain into ending it. That's what podcasting is. You start a sentence with confidence. You don't know where it's going. It's podcasting. And you might know your stand-up comedy bit, but most of it's riffing. And that ability to start with confidence and see what's in the moment and also listen to your partner because we I have a rolling co-host seat so I have a pool of people that are in that co-host chair who are all stand-up comics that are incredible Felicity Ward said to me who's a very well-known comedian and popular uh, co-host she said you're very good at playing off your co-host for the day she said if the co-host is really naughty and is really you know treading the wire for what they're what they're what they're saying comedically um, maybe straying slightly off a feminist path, you become like the school teacher and saying, 
come on now. And, you know, you're funny, but you're making them look funny because you're disapproving of their naughtiness. Whereas if they're a bit school mommy and they're a bit serious, you'll be the naughty one. And I didn't really even know I did that until Flick pointed it out. And now I notice it. But that's improv. That's years of improv. That's not like, well, this is my persona on the podcast. And I guess that wasn't a very funny one because this wasn't a good fit. It's becoming the double act partner that this person needs you to be. And that's completely instinctive to me now because my instincts were retrained by Keith Johnston's methods. So that's that's the thing that has yeah, certainly made me the most successful. I remember once asking Keith to come to a show and I said, Keith, I've lost it. I got really good as an improviser. Our company was going so well and I don't know what happened. We had a TV pilot. We thought it would go to series. It didn't. We all lost a bit of confidence. We lost a bit of motivation. And then we tried some new formats, new venue. We're trying to refresh and it just wasn't going well. And some of the shows were bad. And I was thinking, how could we be this bad? We were really good. And I was really good. Where has this gone? And Keith came and watched and he went, ah, oh, okay. It's not enough to be happy to fail, Deborah. You have to enjoy being bad. And I was like, ah, oh, God damn it. So I went out the next show with my one mission to enjoy being bad. Show was great. That sits with me in podcasting. Because I trust that whatever is happening on stage, if I'm in a joyful state, if I'm enjoying what my partner's doing, if I'm having fun playing with the guest, this show is going to be a joyful place for the audience. And it's really built. It's a live show. And, you know, we're playing the Royal Albert Hall in July. And that is going to be filled with over 5,000 people who want to be in this joyful, entertaining, wonderful space that also focuses on feminism and, and you know, all of the power and gaps and injustices around the world and we come together to rejoice and be in the space and to be able to pilot that i need keith so i wrote an independent film called say my name uh which got made amazingly every film is a miracle it's done so well in film festivals uh we've won so many things it's just been incredible um, we've had loads of screenings through Odeon Cinemas in the UK. It's now being released in America. And I absolutely entirely put that down to my work with Keith's processes and Keith himself. I started writing the film uh, by giving myself an improvised scenario. So I thought, I'm bad with names. And I'll meet someone and think, well, what's their name? You know. So I thought, what if you're in bed with someone and you forgot their name? What would I do? So I started writing that scene. That's all I had. So she's using his name, Staten, and he's going, oh, baby, oh, baby. And she starts saying, say my name, say my name. And he goes, Anne? And she jumps out of bed and gets really angry. And he goes, oh, no, 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 I did a mnemonic. And my sister's name's Anne Marie. And she's like, oh, you, you were thinking about your sister while we were screwing? And he's like, no, no, no. I, I, I just, earlier in the bar, and I did the mnemonic, and I couldn't remember. I knew it was either Anne or Marie. So I'm guessing it's Marie. And she's like, it's Mary. And he's like, oh, it's noisy in the bar. So this scenario plays out, and it's funny. And I get towards the end of how I can play this out. And I'm thinking, what can happen? Completely improv. I've never write a film like this usually. You, normally you sit down with your three-act structure and you've got your high concept. This is a totally improvised writing process. And I remember Raymond Chandler saying, and I remember Keith telling me this, that Raymond Chandler, the detective story writer, he used to say, if you don't know what should happen next, have a man walk in with a gun. And Keith told me that. It's like, well, that's a piece of improvisation as a novelist. Have a man walk in with a gun. So I said, oh, okay, man walks in with a gun. And so these two guys come in and they're doing over the hotel rooms because because what Keith says is, is have a man come with a gun. Then this guy will say, who are you? And he'll just you'll justify your brain can justify much more easily uh, than it can invent. And so I had two guys come with a gun and well, obviously they must be small time crooks just doing over the hotel rooms. Um, this happened to me once I woke up and there was a man in my room. So I was like, this is plausible. And I figured that the guys are doing just like the empty rooms, the people around the nightclubs, people who are asleep. And because these, this couple's having an argument, they think it's kind of funny. They'll just come in and have a mess with them a bit and then leave. And then I was like, listening to Keith's voice in my head, what's the next obvious thing that should happen? Trust your obvious. And so these guys have got these guns and one of them 
one of them sees someone behind him. He thinks he's actually caught sight of something in the mirror, shoots behind him. So this guy shoots and he shoots his partner in the leg. So now what happens? What's the most obvious thing? Well, they can't go out. Now people have heard shots. This guy's hurt, needs a doctor. So this guy goes off to get the other guy a doctor. So now they're sitting in a hotel room and this guy is wounded, but he's got two guns on them. What's next? What's obvious? They start to chat. And so the whole movie is like that. And I would wake up in the night. I wrote it over about two weeks. And I would wake up in the night going, oh, they're going to think, the police are going to come and they're going to think that guy's stunned because of this that happened. Or I, I would wake up and I had so many callbacks that would just come to me. And that's from Keith's method of reincorporating. Um, so yeah, it was 100% written with a Johnston method. And it's the only movie I've ever had made. I've written so many others with the Robert McKee story method where it's all three acts and it's beautifully done and everything that, you know, hero's journey. And this I wrote 100% what happens next, what's obvious, trust your obvious, open the door, what's there, what are they talking about? And it was a total key, it's the only one that's ever been made. In the late 90s, the Royal Court had relocated to the West End because they were doing up the original old building in Sloan Square. And they still needed some fundraising doing and some awareness raising that they were moving back to Sloan Square. And so we contacted the Royal Court and said, hey, why don't we do a fundraiser with Keith Johnston and maybe some of the people that he's worked with in London over the years? And they said that would be wonderful. And the Royal Court wasn't ready, so we did it at the Hackney Empire. Uh, and the Hackney Empire kindly got involved. And it was so great because it was like this big establishment East End Theatre helping this big establishment West End Theatre. But both of them are kind of off the grid a bit. You know, the Royal Court is all new writing and very risk-taking space. And the Hackney Empire um, is really, has a sort of almost like vaudeville feel to it at times. Like there's a lot of comedy there, there's a lot of panto there. It feels like a theatre for the people. So it was this beautiful union. So I asked Fana McDermott if he would co-host the maestro. And I asked Lee Simpson if he would be in it. And then we started to build from there. I remember Jonathan Price coming to do it because he'd worked with Keith at RADA and he was telling amazing stories about how Keith would keep them up all night, uh, sort of, you know, experimenting. I think it was the 60s. A lot of stuff went on. So I remember... Jonathan Price turning up and saying, look, I haven't improvised on stage since RADA, since the 60s. And uh, also I have a birthday party to be at. So I'd really like to get out in one of the first rounds so I can head off to my friend's party. That's the curse. Of course, if you want to go home, you're not going home. The audience were just absolutely loving everything he was doing. And I can remember him kind of coming out like, OK, I want to get out of this scene. I'm just going to do nothing. I'm going to be so boring. And then, of course, absolutely fascinating. Every time he turns his head, everyone's like, oh, what's going to happen next? I'm going to come out and be so ridiculous. They're going to score me low. And it's like, oh, it's it so funny. You know, he's like a clown. And whatever he did, he could not get out. And I came down to him and Neil Malarkey right at the end. And Neil Malarkey just pipped him at the post. But he was there to the bitter end. And of course, lots of the younger improvisers who were like trying to stay in and impress Keith and, Fa and Phelan and trying to play to this big Hackney Empire house. Oh, dropping like flies. But, uh, but I do remember that very well. Jonathan Price going, if I could be out of here by like an 8 or an 8.15, that'd be really great. You know, 10.30, it's like, whoa, Jonathan Price. Um, but Neil Malarkey took him. And, uh, and fair play. Comedy store players twice a week, every week, you know. There's some muscle built there. So I interviewed a lot of people for the Improv Handbook. Keith Johnston was one. Uh, but there were many others, many other practitioners around the world. Patty Stiles, Dan O'Connor. I remember everybody having different answers to the same questions. But they were like a mosaic. They weren't contradictory, they were complementary. And I remember the question I asked that was the most fascinating was, uh, why hasn't improvisation moved on in the way that other art forms have moved on? Because by the time cinema has been, had been going for 60 years, we'd already had 
you know, the golden age of the musical animation. We, 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 you know, we're right into the Godfather territory. Um, and we'd started with, you know, a horse running towards a camera. And so I wanted to know why so many groups were still focusing on some of Keith's early formats, some of Dell's early formats, and we hadn't sort of taken it away and stood on the shoulders of giants. And it was so interesting what everybody said, but I remember different people saying, I remember Dan O'Connor actually saying something interesting, which is, it's so scary learning to improvise. Once you you think, I can do this now, you hold on to that thing, which is, I'm good at the Harold. No need for new things because you already feel like you're teetering on top of a building. Um, and I remember David Fenton, who's an amazing uh, practitioner in, in Australia. Um, I think he said something about the ephemeral nature of it because it disappears every time. You're not building on what was there last time. You're looking at that movie. How can we be better than that? Um, but I remember Keith saying money. There's no financial imperative. He said Hollywood is always trying to make a buck. There's no money in improv. <laughs> he said, when there's money in it, then people will go, oh, we've got to do something new. We've got to do something different. We've got to do something different. When these guys on in, in this theater are making twice what these guys are making and then these, these guys and these guys, you will see it grow. I think that's come true because in this country, anyway, Showstopper have developed this improvised musical that's quite heavily formatted and exceptionally good. And now that's, that's in West End theatres. It's getting big runs. Ostentatious, the same. You know, they're in West End theatres. And they are developing something. They're developing in the form of genre. And so I think everyone was right in their own way. And that was what was wonderful about the answers that came in. But Keith was right in a way that I didn't really see coming because it sounded like the most cynical answer. And yet I feel like it's coming true. When I started working in the corporate world, I was doing seminars for people in business, uh, especially women in business, uh, looking at diversity and inclusion. And I started to use a lot of Keith's status work um, because you know, Keith would say if someone wants to look like a queen, they have to know what kind of things does a queen do to convince other people she's in charge of the room. And so I started to look at that in terms of high status behaviors, but high status behaviors are often seen as negative. High status people are often seen as somebody who, who, want, who wants to lower the status of people around them. So I started looking at people like, um, at that time, Bill Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, and I realized what they were doing was keeping their status high physically, but raising the status of the people around them. And I thought that's a valuable skill. And I remember very clearly using it myself. I was, I was hired to go in and do some kind of improv creativity day. And anyone who's taught improv in co the corporate world will know that there's generally one or two people there who feel like captives, who are like, I don't wanna be here. And sometimes uh, their strategy is to undermine the process because if this is stupid, and there's no value in it. It doesn't matter if they're not good at it. It's coming from a place of fear. And so my strategy was to raise that person's status. Because I, I used to find, if there was, it was generally a guy, sorry, but let's be honest, it was. And the guy would be like, oh, I'm making all kinds of trouble and trying to get like a group of people around him who were all being like, you know, this isn't worth doing, this is stupid. And I would get him to do something in front of the group and then I would find something genuinely authentically good about it whatever there must be something good about it whatever was good about it I would say oh see what Matt did there that's what I was talking about before so Matt that's your talent I trust you're obvious you're obvious is your talent and I would see it every single time he'd go well oh, I thought she was an idiot but she did recognize my genius so she must know something and then he this ringleader would start going, this is actually kind of interesting. Go, come on, guys, come on, this is really interesting. And he would start telling everyone how valuable the process was and then start chatting to me in the break. I use it from a place of goodness, not manipulation, um, because there's always something good about that person. There's always something good that they do. And they're always frightened. They're always frightened. And you, want, you don't want to give that person status because they're trying to take it from you. But I have to think... I'm like the Bill Gates of status. It's just status that's coming up behind me. You know, if you have lunch with Bill Gates, he gets the bill because 
He's made millions of dollars while he's been sitting there talking to you. It would be weird for you to get the bill. So I feel like I have to be the Bill Gates of status. I can see it coming up behind me. I'm like, oh, he's trying to take my status. Give him more, give him more, give him more, give him more. And that's pure Keith. I would just like to talk about if you have been in a high control group, as I was, or any other traumatic situation, we all carry trauma. You know what I always say? If it's not a cult, it's a divorce. Do you know what I mean? It's something. Everyone's got a thing. Everyone in their upbringing's got something. And we all hold a lot of trauma in our body. And it is worth learning Keith Johnston's techniques because we are living, breathing humans who are desperately in search of connection and understanding. And what this world needs more than anything now is compassion and connection. We need to look into each other's eyes and ask the question, what do you want? How do you feel? So way beyond the theater and certainly way beyond the idea of what we produce. Everything's now about what we produce. Have you been productive today? You know, you're, you're enjoying a new hobby. Well, you could monetize that. And Keith, I think one reason Keith isn't perhaps revered by the wider establishment is because Keith's never been interested in that. Keith was always asking the question, what does your partner want? What's the kindest act you could, you could make right now? What is between us is completely free. It doesn't harm the environment doesn't really make a buck. It's just here, it's just now, it's just you, it's just me, it's just listening, it's just heart. It's not really that productive. And that's why it's so wonderful. And it's almost everything the world needs right now.